My name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here. GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you're interested in watching the original solutions to any one of those problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 291. Please turn to it. Page number 291, problem number 172 is what we are looking at. Problem number 172 is a pretty straightforward simple simple question. The question simply is, is an an integer? We have some quantity n. The question is, is that guy an integer? What they tell us in the first statement is that n squared is an integer. As n squared is an integer. As we can clearly see, but simply knowing that the square of the quantity is an integer is not going to help us determine whether or not n itself is an integer. For example, for example, n could be n could be square root of three. n could be square root of three, in which case the square of square root of three is an integer. But square root of three is not an integer. Or maybe a, a, n itself is three. Who knows? Maybe n, n could be a 3, in which case uh, n squared is also an integer. You get the idea. So this is not enough. The first statement is not enough. Simply knowing that the square of a quantity is an integer does not mean that the number itself is going to be an integer. Square root of 7 is not an integer. But if you square the square root of 7, it is an integer. The first statement does not do the job. A, D, B, C, E. Now that, now that we have established that the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now answer cannot be A or D. Let's look at second statement. Okay, enough of the talk. Let's look at second statement. In the second statement, they go on to tell us, in the second statement, they go on to tell us that square root of n is an integer. Well, now we are getting someplace. If square root of n is an integer, if square root of n is an integer, let's call it k, k is an integer here, then what that means is that if you were to square the square root of n, which is k squared, which is simply going to be integer times integer. So if n, if a square root of n is an integer, if a square root of n is an integer, then n must n itself must be an integer because n is what? What is? How do we go from here to n? We simply square both sides. I'm doing it one more time. If we square both sides, we then get the n, and this n must also be an integer because n is simply the square root of n times square root of n, which means it is simply an integer, an integer times an integer. And of course, if you take any any integer multiplied by another integer, of course you're going to get an integer. So second statement, second statement does do the job. Second statement does actually enable us to say for sure that if if square root of some quantity is an integer, if square root of some quantity is an integer, then that quantity must, itself must also be an integer. Has to be. The answer is B. Let's look at number 173, the penultimate question, the second to the last question. One hundred and seventy-three. One hundred and seventy-three. I try I try I've been trying to control myself, but I can't help it, so let's let's do it more for the one last time. Penultimate question. Penultimate, as we as we have learned this word on several different occasions. Every time we get to the penultimate question on the page, there we go. The penultimate question. Question is simply is simply a very fancy way of saying second to the last. We are on the penultimate question because there are only 174 of them. This is a momentous occasion. We are on 173 now, and I believe we learned it on day number 27. We done this. We have done it so many times that I even remember the day number when we learned it. Penultimate, unless I'm wrong. We learned it on day number 11, not 27. Vocabulary, day 11. If you're interested in improving your vocabulary, just type in GMAT vocabulary words, GMAT vocabulary words, day 11, and you will see the video there where we learned about penultimate, where you will learn some other useful and interesting words. 173. In 173, they tell us that 
x, y, and z are positive integers. We are told that they are whole numbers and they are positive quantities. The question simply is, is the difference of x and y odd? Interesting question. Is the difference of x and y odd? Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement they tell us that x equals z squared. Well, simply knowing that x, is x equals z squared, we can put, put z squared in there, but that's not going to get us anywhere at all because we know nothing at all about y to say nothing of the fact that we know nothing at all about z itself. So the first statement clearly does not do anything. A, D, B, C, E. Now that you started that the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now, answer is not A or D. Answer would have to be either B, C, or E. Let's look at second statement. Second statement, they go on to tell us that y equals to, y is equal to z minus 1 squared. Again, the same thing. We could actually substitute this quantity y right here. We could substitute this quantity z minus 1 whole squared in here. But that's not going to get us anywhere for two reasons. First of all, we know nothing at all about x from the second statement. And even if we did know something about the x, we know nothing at all about, x, uh, about z. So second statement by itself also is not going to do us anything. That's not going to do anything. We have to know something at all. We need more. Second statement by itself is not going to do anything. Let's put the two statements together and see what it gets us. Just out of curiosity, okay? Just watch this. Just out of curiosity. If you have to find out whether this quantity, knowing I'm digressing here, I'm digressing big time, okay? I'm dig digressing big time. Watch what happens. If somebody were to ask you about why, is why even or odd? This is not part of the deal. I'm just making it up impromptu. It may come out okay, it may not. Is y odd or even? Let's see what, what, what happens. What's going to happen is that now that we know y equals this quantity, which is the same as z squared minus 2 times z minus 1. Well, 2 times z is going to be even because 2 is even. Anything even times even times even or even times odd is going to be even. And this is odd, which means this quantity, even minus odd, 4 minus 3 is 1, which is going to be odd. But we still do not know what z is. If z happens to be odd, if z happens to be odd, then odd times odd is odd. But if z happens to be even, then even times even is even. And, 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 and of course the answer is going to change because either we're going to have even minus odd or odd minus odd. So we have to know something about z. If we were looking at second statement by itself and the question was, is y even or odd? Is y even or odd. If the question was, if the question was, is y even or odd, in that case, second statement would not have been enough. As you can see, what I'm trying to point out here is that this is very limited information. Let's put the two together and just, let's just concentrate, let's just consider what is being asked, which is, is the difference odd? Let's find out, shall we? x minus y. So we're going to put them together now. If you put 1 and 2 together, and we find that x minus y, x we know is z squared, and y we know is this quantity, which can be written as z squared minus 2z plus 1. We just open the square here, that's, that's all. And we have a minus outside, so it's going to be z squared minus z squared, and then minus times minus negative times negative is going to become positive, and then negative times positive is going to remain negative 1. Are you with me? We're almost there. That's it. Z squared is going to cancel out. So the question simply is this. Is this quantity 2z minus 1 Ah, That's what they're asking. They're asking here. This thing is same as 2z minus 1. This thing is same as 2z minus 1. And what can we say? Is that odd or even? Let's find out, shall we? Let's find out. 2 times z. It doesn't matter it doesn't matter whether z is, whether it, it, it makes no difference whether z is even or odd, because 2 is even, 2 is even, and even times odd is even, and even times even is even. So this quantity is always going to be even. An even number, this quantity is going to be even, 2 times z is even, 2 times z is even, and minus 1, which is odd. And what do we know about even minus odd? Even minus odd, 4 minus 1 is 3. 
It's odd. I don't memorize them. Do you understand? Even minus odd, I just make up an even number. I just make up an odd number. 10 minus 3 is 7, which is odd. So even minus odd is odd. The question was, is this quantity odd? The answer turns out, yes, it is odd. Now, even if it turned out to be even here, still putting the two statements together does do the job nicely. Because let's pretend, let's pretend, let's pretend that it comes out to be even. Let's just pretend it comes out to be even. In which case, the question was, is this quantity odd? If it turns out to be even, you would say, no, it is not odd. But even in that case, the answer still would have been C to this problem because we are able to tell definitively either yes or a no. It's just a fluke, it's just a coincidence that the answer here turns out to be a positive one. Answer here turns out to be an affirmative one. Yes, it is odd. Even minus odd is odd. Putting the two statements together does the job very nicely. The answer to this question is C. Answer to this question is C. Let's do the very last one. The reason I went through all this, uh, all this mumbo jumbo right now is because to remind you for the very last time, because we are about to do the very last problem, 174 is the very last one, and each time I remind you that it doesn't matter whether the answer to their question turns out to be yes or a no. We don't care about that part. We just have to be able to answer the question affirmative. Uh, we just have to be able to answer the questions definitively. We just have to give the, a definite answer. It doesn't matter whether the answer is yes or a no. Is Michael dead? By putting the two statements together, we know for a fact that Michael is in fact dead. It does. Is Michael alive? The answer is no, Michael is not alive. As long as you are able to tell that Michael is not alive, we really don't give a damn that the, Mike, the fact that the Michael is dead. Do you understand? If the answer turns out to be negative, it really doesn't concern us. We just have to be able to give an answer, a yes or a no. Let's go to number 174, the last one. Number 174, the last one. One hundred and seventy-four, and the question is very simple. Very simple. The question is, what is the capacity of the bucket? We have a bucket, and the question simply is, what is the capacity of it? Marshall's bucket can hold maximum of how much water? How many liters of water? Well, let's find out for Marshall's sake, if not for ours. Statement number one tells us that the bucket now has 9 liters. Well simply knowing that the bucket is holding right now 9 liters does not in any way at all enable us to figure out what the capacity of the damn thing is. Does it? We do not know how much, is, how the, bloody th how much the bloody thing is going to hold, how many liters. We know it has 9 liters. It may hold another 90,000 liters or it may hold no more liters anymore, maybe it's completely full or it may hold only one more liter. Maybe the capacity is 10 liter or maybe the capacity is 10 million liters, who knows? That by itself does not do the job. The first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we have established that the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. By the way, this is our last video on, on, on data sufficiency. This is the 174, the very last question. Therefore, just for the sake of reminding you, for, for the very last time, I'm going to remind you because this is, let me make a loom, room here. And this is something we did in the beginning, in the beginning videos, in the first few videos, first 10 or 20 videos, I did it in every single video, and then I stopped doing it. I'm going to do it one more time, one last time. If you have not watched this video, data sufficiency, intro. Just type in my name and then put in data sufficiency intro. Data sufficiency intro. Type in my name, Kishwani, and then data sufficiency intro and watch that video. Make sure you understand how to set up this problem, which is which is very important. Setting up, knowing how to set up this problem, knowing how what the answer choices mean and knowing how to manage them is very important, particularly under the under the circumstances where you have immense time pressure. Under under the time pressure, you don't want to squander your precious seconds struggling with uh, having to remember what this uh, what does does d mean this or does d mean that or does what do i keep, what do i keep b or throughout uh, throughout b which is why we always set it up like this in case you're always wondering there is a reason for it watch the video and learn it so first statement by itself does not do the job 
let's look at second statement. In the second statement, they tell us that if if three liters were added, if three liters were added to the bucket, when the bucket is half full, the level rises by a third. Level rises by a third. Well, let's take a let's take a look at the picture. The picture would help here quite a lot. Let's take a look at the picture. So here's our bucket. And the bucket is half full. When when the bucket is half full. So we're gonna make half full bucket. Here's the bucket, it is half full. And at that instance, if you were to add three liters, if you were to add three liters, the level rises by a third. So let's bring this up into third first. One, two, three. And as a result of adding three liters, if you add it, these are the three thirds, one, two, and three, it rises by this much level. It rises by this much level again. It rises by a third. It rises by this much level. This represents three liters. Well, if this represents three liters, whatever the whatever the level was before, it rises by a third of that level. A third of that level is a third of a third of this amount. If this rises by a third of the level before, which was half here, which has been divided into three parts, this rises by, by a third, and that's the, the result of adding three liters. That tells us that, as we as we presented here, one, two, three, this is the fourth part, this was the fifth, and this was the sixth. These are sixth of the bucket. These these mark this markers represent sixth of the bucket. And now we know that a sixth of a bucket is three liters. This tells us, this implies, that one-sixth of the bucket, one-sixth of the capacity, is three liters. That's what that tells us. If one-third of the, one, if one-sixth of the capacity, if the one-sixth of the capacity is three liters, then of course the, the capacity is uh, six times three, eighteen liters. That's all. The second statement does the job quite nicely. Second statement does the job quite nicely. The answer is B. Now the beauty of these questions, the beauty of this question is that if you misread this question, if you slightly misunderstood the question, listen carefully, if you misread the question, if you slightly misunderstood the question, and if you ended up saying that three liter represents a third of a bucket, still you would say that if, well, if three liter is a third of the bucket, the capacity is nine liters, which is wrong actually, but that's okay. This, these questions in that sense are forgiving in the sense that if you make slight error in your understanding or in your calculation, it doesn't matter because nobody is asking us, nobody is asking us here what is the capacity of the bucket. The question here is, are we able to figure out the capacity? The answer is yes. The second statement provides us sufficient data to be able to figure out the capacity of the bucket and therefore the answer is B. You understand? That was it. That was a long journey that we had. That was a long journey that we, that we started. Day number 352. Let me put this on the top here, just for the sake of, just for the sake of uh, record keeping. Today is day number 360. Today is day number 360, beginning with day number 252. You see, we did from day number one through 250. Day number one through 250, we did the problems for the very first time, which was some some time ago, a couple of years ago, and I decided to redo them beginning with day number 251, which was a multiple, uh, which was a problem solving question. 251 was a problem solving question. 252 is data sufficiency question, the very first one. And we did that on December 4th of last year, 2013. And today, as we speak, we finish our project and today happens to be March 1st of 2014. So approximately, approximately approximately three months but it was fun I hope you got something out of it if you need help if you need some more help if you need some private tutoring if you need some uh, personal personal attention personal help uh, you know how to get hold of me you can go to go to my website any of this website address any of this website address will take you to the same website which is kashwaniprep.com send me an email from there and we'll go from there okay good luck to you on the on the test we are still not done with problem solving questions. Uh, I was about to close the video. We are still not done with the problem solving questions. There are 230 problem solving questions. And as I speak right now, 
we have done about 200 of them. So we have still have 30 more to go. We have 30 more problems to go, which means the whole project is going to end in about day number 370. Day seven, 370, where the whole project is going to end, where we, by, by, day, by 370, we will have finished all the problem solving questions as well. Okay? So keep watching the problem solving questions. As I said, we have about 30 more problems to go from day number 200, from problem number 201 through 230 approximately. Okay. Bye now.